Our scripture today is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Jesus and his followers came into Jericho. As Jesus was leaving Jericho together with his disciples and a sizable crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, Timaeus' son, was sitting beside the road. When he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was there, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, show me mercy. Many scolded him, telling him to be quiet, but he shouted even louder, Son of David, show me mercy. Jesus stopped and said, Call him forward. They called the blind man. Be encouraged. Get up. He's calling you. Throwing his coat to the side, he jumped up and came to Jesus. Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, Teacher, I want to see. Jesus said, Go. Your faith has healed you. At once he was able to see, and he began to follow Jesus on the way. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Mark. Well, I hope you're enjoying a little bit of preview of the uh, welcoming space out there. It's pretty exciting to see that uh, walls down and uh, how much open and uh, Gathering, visiting space, there'll be places to stand around, drink coffee, and maybe meet someone that you don't uh, get to talk to normally. And so I'm really excited about getting that done, as you can tell. And, and I'm sure a lot of you are happy to have the restrooms back in service, which will happen, I understand, one of these days. And I joked with Jennifer, I said, I'm going to tell everyone that the porta potty was out back when those were closed, but um, she told me I couldn't say that, so I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> anyway, but there's more, as you know. Well, today we're talking about the healing of a beggar named Bartimaeus. And I think that when you look at these stories, and, uh, and you take just the story isolated by itself, you get one impression, you get this idea, well, Jesus did a miracle where a man named Bartimaeus needed to see and he wanted to see, and, and Jesus heals him. But I want to go back and help bring you up to this point in Mark 10. If you look at the Gospel of Mark, and you go back to where we've been the last several weeks, I think you'll see how all these stories tie together and how they're telling us something about, uh, about God through Jesus Christ and how human nature plays into our relationship in so many ways and many times not in the most productive ways, right? There are things that we do that are not always bringing us closer to God. There is a parallel text to this in Matthew, and it's, I, I'm calling it a semi-parallel because it's quite a bit different, but, but it's in the same place and time. It's Matthew 20, verse 29 to 34. And it actually talks about two blind men that happened to be in Jericho that stopped Jesus. And the rest of the story is pretty similar, where they asked Jesus to show us mercy. And so it's an interesting parallel, but uh, slightly different. We're going to stick with Mark today to keep the, the story consistent. But let's talk about what it is that is being taught through this part of the gospel. What is it that Jesus wants us to know? And if you go back to the beginning of Mark 10... The very first lesson there, the Pharisees are trying to trick Jesus into breaking the law. And they said, well, is it legal for a man to divorce his wife? And uh, they want Jesus to, to say something that's against the law. And Jesus says, well, Moses said it was okay to write your wife a letter of, of divorce and just leave her. And Jesus says that's because they were hard-hearted. That's because they were hard-hearted. Because back then, if you were to divorce... Uh, Primarily, if a man would leave his wife, she would be left destitute. She would have no way to, she would, he would be forcing her into poverty. And so this is something Jesus spoke out against. And he says, things that God bring together as a marriage should not be broken. As we say in all the marriage vows we say today, this really shouldn't be broken. I know there's many situations where it's appropriate because of abuse and a lot of things like that. But that's not really what Jesus is addressing. He's addressing this practice that they had that Moses had given them permission to do, would just write a letter, says, I divorce you, and leave. And he said, that's not appropriate. And so you see what the lesson of that is. That's about self-centeredness, and it's about thinking about what you want, not what you should do, what your obligations are. And the very next lesson after that is the lesson about coming to Christ uh, as a child, that we, most, we need to come to Christ uh, with an open heart, that we're willing to show love and return, that we don't have a lot of, of agenda in the background, that we... We must come to Christ as a child. We must come with that kind of acceptance, that kind of love. And so Jesus immediately follows us speaking about divorce with this idea about that we must 
come to faith as a child. It's, uh, then moving on to verse 17 of Mark, then we hear the story of the rich man that comes to Jesus. And the rich man comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Because basically he's got everything he wants, right? I mean, he's got all the money and property and he's got all the toys of this world he wants. He realized, I guess I ought to probably fix this relationship with God. Maybe I'll go talk to Jesus and say, what is it I need to do? This, what's the final thing I need to do to fix my life eternally? And Jesus, Jesus looks him over and, of course, he says, well, you need to follow the Ten Commandments, which the man says, well, I've always done those, of course. You know, I mean, if God asked you and you said you always did them, I'll know, well... Think about that again, okay? There may be a couple of them that you might have uh, uh, quibbled on a little bit here and there, right? But uh, this idea that the man said, well, I've done all those things. And he said, well, then the only thing that's standing in the way between you and eternal life is all your stuff. So if you sell all your stuff and give all the money to the poor, then you can come follow me. And you won't have any burden of all these other things you're kind of trying to keep track of. And we talk about that not being a condemnation to having things. It's about if your things are your God then God is put second place. God is a jealous God in that he wants to be first in your life. And if you keep God first, everything else will fall in line. But if you don't do that, and you get your stuff ahead of that, or your wealth, or whatever it is, your prestige, your power, uh, control, you put all these things, you put any of that stuff ahead of God, then you've got your things, your order of life and priorities mixed up. And so that's kind of the basic message of, of the, the rich man trying to follow Jesus. Then moving to verse 32 of Mark 10, 32, you see how these all connected? See how it's all about whether we're focused on ourselves or whether we're focused on God? In Mark uh, 32, Jesus then, uh, and this he's done, this is the third time he's done this, but he tells his disciples that the Son of Man, referring to himself, is going to be arrested and beaten and tortured and die on the cross, and the third day he's going to rise from the dead. Hallelujah! That's the story of the gospel. And the disciples says, hey, by the way, Jesus, um, just James and John, right? Sons of Zebedee, and they say, you know, Lord, um, I hear all that stuff. I don't know what it means exactly, but but when you get into your glory, can, can we sit on each on your right and your left? I mean, that's what we'd really like to do. We want that place of honor in your kingdom, because after all, we did leave everything behind, and we've been following you, and, and Jesus says, well, that's not for me to give. He says, can you really drink the cup that I'm about to drink, which is the crucifixion? Can you suffer the baptism that I'm about to suffer, which is his death? And they say, absolutely. Whatever it takes to sit on your right and left, we'll do that. Do you see the theme going on here in Mark 10? Going on to today's lesson. This is immediately before what I said. The story of the James and John trying to get places of prominence comes immediately before today's lesson. And this, I feel, is the answer to all the problems that have been proposed in the early part of Mark 10. And Jesus and his disciples are, are they've come to Jericho on their way to Jerusalem because the gospel messages, if you look at all the gospels, they, they are a journey from uh, Jesus' birth, and not all of them record the birth, but, but it's about Jesus' life and to his final entry into Jerusalem where he has his arrest and crucifixion. So that's the gospel message, and each of them follow basically a chronology like that. And so it's talking about Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. And so this is a part of that journey, and they've come to Jericho, and they've, he's taught there for a while, and they're, they're leaving Jericho, heading to Jerusalem, and there beside the road is a blind man named Bartimaeus. Now it's interesting that his name is Bartimaeus because Bar means son of in Aramaic. So any of the words you see like Bartholomew and other names like that, Bartimaeus, that is, they are the son of Timaeus is who he is. He's the son of Timaeus. And so he has been a beggar uh, probably his whole life because he's blind. He can't see. And if he can't see, in those days you can't work. And if you can't work, then you have no money because there probably was no assistance program. It only be what people would decide to drop in your cup as they walk by. So Bartimaeus is in a difficult life situation. He doesn't really have any options. So he sits beside the road, and he says, alms for the blind or whatever. He's always saying, can you help me in some way? And I can't even imagine living a life like that. But the other problem with that, not only does he have to beg to be taken care of, but he's shunned by society. And the people that see him there 
think he must be cursed by God or otherwise he wouldn't be blind. And you say, well, we'd never think like that today. But sometimes how do we treat those who are blind and deaf and have other disabilities? Do we sometimes push them aside? Do we sometimes treat them like they're not full citizens, that they don't have all the rights that everyone else has? This is a big problem. And so when Bartimaeus calls out to Jesus and says, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus of Nazareth, come and, and, and heal me. And the disciples and all the other people, of course, they're irritated by anybody that's a disabled anyway, so they're saying, shut up, you are bothering your father. You just keep quiet. You know, they don't want to hear him yelling at Jesus. But finally, Jesus hears it, doesn't he? And Jesus hears it and says, well, bring him forward. Bring him forward. And so, so the, the, then the crowd kind of changes their tune and say, well, take courage. Be, be encouraged because now he really does want to talk to you. And so they tell uh, Bartimaeus, come, come, because Jesus wants to see you. And Bartimaeus jumps up. He jumps to his feet and he throws off his cloak and he runs to Jesus. <coughs> he runs up to him and Jesus says, what do you want? The same question he asks James and John, right? What is it they want? They wanted to see on Jesus and right and left. And the rich man said, what do you want? I want eternal life. And he says, well, you've got to get rid of all this stuff. But the blind man says, I want to see. I want to see. And Jesus doesn't touch him. He doesn't make a poultice of mud and some of the other stories in the scripture about he does. He doesn't do any of that in this case. He says, your faith has made you well. And Bartimaeus is so excited. He jumps for joy. And, 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 he, and he, he just leaves everything behind and follows Jesus. He decides that at that moment, there's nothing more important in his world than to follow this healer, the man who truly must be of God, that can heal him just through his faith. And Bartimaeus is healed. The story of Bartimaeus is a lot more than a story of a miracle of healing a blind man. Yes, Jesus healed Bartimaeus. Jesus healed him of his, of his blindness. But there's a lot more in this story because the blindness that Bartimaeus suffers is the same blindness that many of us suffer at times. The same blindness that we can't see beyond our own little world. We can't see beyond the things that are physically there in front of us. We can't see the fact that God loves us with a love that cannot fail because we see too many failures of love all around us. We can't see that God truly has set a plan through his son Jesus, that we may spend eternity with him through his son, through the grace that we can only receive through Jesus Christ. And so Bartimaeus knew it. Bartimaeus had that faith that he talks about in Hebrews, that, that faith is a, the confidence of something you can't see, right? Faith is something that you believe with all your heart and soul is true, and you've never seen it before. And that's where we find ourselves, isn't it? That we trust in the Lord that we can't see. We trust that God loved us so much that he sent his son into the world that we might be saved through him. That Jesus' love and grace is sufficient for all of us. That each of us can be made allowed to see through our relationship with Jesus. That through his, through his love and grace, we too can see. So, so Bartimaeus' blindness becomes like a metonym for all of our blindness, right? That we're all blind to certain things in our life. There's certain things we just can't see because, well, we're Missourians, right? We say, show me. Right? Do you ever do that? I mean, some of you probably escaped from Iowa and see me. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> That's right. Offense to Iowa, so I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> we're from Iowa. But this idea that, that if, unless you see it, you don't believe it, right? Unless you see it, you don't believe it. And, that, and the, the whole crux of faith is that you're believing something you can't see, but you have the confidence that the Lord is there. And you have the confidence that he will never abandon you. No matter where you feel in your life, that you're going through a situation where you feel like you're ultimately blind and you can't possibly understand it. If you pray about it, sometimes you get eyes to see into things that you couldn't have seen before. You get eyes to see things that you didn't know really was true. 
But if you read it in the scripture and you pray about it and you realize that God continues to deliver you time and time again, one of the ways that I, I see that God has opened my eyes is looking back to my life. You ever do that and think, you know, it's hard to see God going forward. Yeah, that takes a lot of faith when you step out into, into an unknown territory. But if you look back, you can gain a lot of confidence because you can know that God has brought me to this point today. That God has brought me through so many things in my life that I didn't deserve his love and grace. And yet he continued to show it to me. He continued to allow me to, uh, to go on. He continued to show me love when I know I didn't deserve love. He continued to reach out to me and says, come, as he did to Bartimaeus. And the problem that many of us have is we're not willing to throw our cloak on the ground and run to him. Many of us are not willing to lay aside the stuff of this world in order to go and be with Jesus. They were too tied. We're, we're, we're in like our straddling a crevice that keeps getting wider. We want to stay on each side. We want to stay on the world and on, and on God's side at the same time. And we can't keep doing it. We have to allow God to permeate our soul through His Son, Jesus Christ. We must allow that grace and peace that comes from God to be what we and show to others, that we demonstrate for others in all of our actions and our words. And so my question for you is, how is it that you struggle with things? What is it in your life that you struggle with that really is like Bartimaeus' cloak? Because that probably is a beggar that was all he had. That cloak was all that kept him warm at night. But he's willing to throw it down and to follow Jesus with nothing in his hands, nothing with himself. Say, you can have all of me, Lord, just heal me and allow me to see. And how could if we did that, could we follow Jesus more fully? Could we trust him more completely? Could we truly be one of his disciples? And that's a question only you can answer for yourself. So what is it you need to lay aside so that you allow yourself to be healed and fully experience?